Uh, Seamus, let's talk about um, Klaus Schwab. Uh, just stereotypical central casting Bond villain Klaus Schwab, who also happens to control uh, like a, a global, <laughs> like a sort of pseudo government organization. What, what what happened with Klaus Schwab this week? Yeah, so the uh, it came out via email that he would be stepping back, kind of retreating into the shadows. Not he's not gone. He'll still be uh, the the chairman of the board of trustees, but he's no longer in an executive role at the World Economic Forum. And uh, that's sort of big news. The bigger news I find is that the World Economic Forum is admitting that it's no longer just a country club for billionaires to virtue signal about climate change. It's uh, going to be the leading global institution for public private partnership. And so what does that mean? Uh, That means that they're going to be getting more and more involved in your life, whether you're uh, no matter what country you're in, they're going to be influencing your government. Klaus Schwab says he's penetrating uh, the governments of the world. And uh, those are his words. And yeah, so this is, this is uh, not good. I thought, like, how is this different than what they've already been doing? What, like, like what, wasn't this already the point? Is that this group of global elites is already doing things that are controlling us? How could they make it worse? Well, yeah, you're exactly right. Since 2015, really, they've been working on public-private partnerships. Uh, the fact they're now admitting it is that it's their primary agenda to get the governments of the world to work with the corporations uh, should tell you that they're not going to be slowing down. They never really admitted, uh, you know, they don't like to admit it. They say they call you a conspiracy theorist. If you say the world economic forum is plotting with governments to affect government policy. Um, now they're just saying it openly. So that's, that's really the only change. They'll they'll keep doing the same thing, but what the public private partnership is, is the key here because most people don't know what that means. They think, Oh, partnerships are good. And, uh, public private working together, that might not be bad. Really what it is, is it's fascism. <clears throat> we saw it in the pandemic where if a government couldn't lock you down, they'd get the businesses to do it. They'd refuse you entry. So the government can't forcibly inject you. But if you uh, wanted to go to a restaurant or wanted to go to a sporting event, those companies could deny you. And there's a, there's a, a ton yes. of other examples of how uh, they get the corporations to do their dirty work uh, that the government can't do. For example, big tech censorship. Uh, it's apparently not a First Amendment violation if a corporation silences you and censors you. And we know that the government would basically just, the Biden administration would just send an email to Facebook saying, hey, take this post down and Facebook would comply and hide behind kind of uh, a corporation's right to do so. Yes. Give us a, give us a, something recent that they've been stewing about over at the World Economic Forum that we should be concerned about moving forward. Well, I'd say the biggest thing that they're, I mean, the Davos 2024, they said uh, the theme was, quote, rebuilding trust. Um, that's just lip service. Obviously, they know they're not going to be rebuilding any trust with uh, most of the peasants around the world. But the real theme of Davos 2024 was artificial intelligence, and you're seeing it everywhere. It's just blowing up, uh, and this is going to be their tool for total control. It's going to put a lot of people out of work. Um, That's what they say, Um, and estimates vary from 40 to 80 percent of the job force uh, affected negatively. And so uh, what that is going to lead to is calls for Uh, more and more checks, universal basic income, welfare checks. Well, Sam Altman has got you covered. That's the head of OpenAI, ChatGPT. And he says, in order to get your checks, you'll have to have, of course, a biometric digital ID. They got to know who they're sending the check to. Uh, They also say that central bank digital currencies will be a great way to get you your cash faster. And so uh, not to worry, if you've lost your job, you'll just be totally locked down in the pod eating the bugs. I, uh, I'm, I, I want everyone to be very aware of this concept that you just touched on, and that is uh, efficiency. I, I, I fear that tyranny will be presented to us and pitched to us as so much more efficient. And we put such a value on that that a lot of people will fall for it. 
like, oh, digital uh, income, I don't know, that doesn't seem like a great idea, or like your spidey senses kind of tingle when you hear that, that doesn't sound good. But it will be a lot easier, Seamus. Like, if you think about it, the money just goes right into my, and I'm done, I don't have to think about anything, and it's, it's already there, and I'm already kind of doing it already, so what's the big deal anyway? Uh, do they make that argument a lot, or am I making that up? Oh, yeah, it's all, it's all about efficiency. It's either, it's either for uh, convenience or for security. So they kind of go back and forth between this for your convenience or it's for your safety and security. Um, but we, but we've seen this, we've seen this movie play out actually during the pandemic. I mean, people say that, uh, why do you talk about the pandemic? It's over. And it's like, no, 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 this was just a blueprint for the future. And so when you, you know, when you talk about central bank digital currencies or digital IDs, you know, some people think that that's sort of conspiracy theory. It's like, no, we, we saw this happen with the, uh, with the vaccine passports, with those vaccine cards. If you didn't have your card, this, this prepared the businesses for what is ultimately a social credit score like they have in China. People were denied entry. You were not allowed to move around. Uh, and it's the same thing with the digital currency. We've seen this play out, how they leverage your bank account against you, uh, whether it's the Canadian truckers. I mean, they, they seized and froze their assets. Uh, with January 6 protesters, the, the banks would cooperate with the feds with no warrants, uh, totally violating Fourth Amendment. And uh, in Ireland and across Europe, uh, a lot of these protesters, their, their own politicians in Ireland and other countries, I mean, whether it's the, far, the farmer convoys, um, they want to seize their uh, assets or at least shut down the payments. And so once you're dependent on payments and, you know, uh, central di bank digital currencies, they will be able to quickly freeze your assets and make you do whatever they want. And it's like so many people uh, complied during the pandemic. It's like, oh, I don't want to lose my job. And that's, and that's everything. Money is everything for uh, if you don't, if you can't feed your family, you will uh, comply in most cases for most people. That's so obviously it. That, 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 that as the means of control. Tyrants in the past didn't have the ability to control your bank account like they do now. It's, it's so obviously it. Um, what, what, so we're talking about some specific, we've been talking about specifics. How would you describe, we're talking with Seamus Bruner, author of Controlligarchs, uh, where one of the chapters is about uh, Klaus Schwab, although he weaves his way through many of them. Um, what would you say is the worldview of these people? And we can compare that to, to our, whether it's American worldview or conservative worldview or a Christian worldview, but, but how would you compare that to the worldview of, of Klaus Schwab specifically? <laughs> well, it's not a conservative or a Christian worldview, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I, would, I would describe it as anti-human. Everything that they do is anti-human, anti, it's not natural. I mean, Klaus Schwab talks about this fourth industrial revolution. He's kind of giddy about it, the idea of maybe living forever um, and, and, you know, implanting microchips in brains and, and biotechnological upgrades. Um, and so these, these are anti-human types where, I mean, even Elon Musk working with Neuralink, I mean, you see some of the medical benefits, um, but, that you know, there's a, a quadriplegic and nobody could be against a quadriplegic being able to move or, or do things with their mind. Uh, but that's not the end goal here. The end goal is try, they want to live forever. They want to upload their brains to the cloud uh, and, and maybe download them into some sort of Android. And so, I mean, that's, that's the long-term view. They think that in their lifetimes, they will be able to crack immortality. Um, but I would say that, I mean, the, the, the worldview is maybe something called a technocrat. A technocrat is the rule by a scientific elite. The peasants are just too dumb mm. to be making decisions. And so that's why we need the engineers and the scientists to make all the decisions. It is an inherently uh, undemocratic or anti-democratic system. People do not have a say. I mean, that's why you don't, uh, you, none of these guys are elected and they love it that way. And because they're unelected, people like Klaus Schwab, or even Bill Gates or any of the other controls, Arch George Soros I lay out in the book, because they're unelected, they're unaccountable. So they hate uh, being held accountable. And, and that's the type of system they want. It's maybe something like in China, uh, like a state run capitalism where the corporations are private, but all of the monopoly on the coercive use of violence uh, that the state has is at their disposal. And so they can privatize all of the profits socialize all of the losses and throw anyone who uh, tries to push back into the gulag. 
Uh, the book's called Control the Garks. Um, I'm, it, Klaus Schwab's stepping down from at least the top position, but as you said, still involved. It's pretty impressive, actually, if we just step aside for a moment, that Klaus Schwab was able to put together this group, <laughs> this world economic. It's turned it, like he's not that rich. Like he's richer than you or me. I don't know how much money you've made off your book, Control the Garks. He's richer than us. But there's people richer than him that have not put together this pseudo one world government organization. Like, it's a pretty impressive thing he's created. Does, did he plan on doing something like this? Like, how did he pull this off? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, so I'll try to give the very short version of the story. He, he's, he's an academic. I mean, he's a, he's kind of a nerd. Uh, he went to he multiple, got multiple degrees, three or four degrees, uh, ends up at Harvard, uh, under the tutelage of, one Henry Kissinger. This is before Henry Kissinger was uh, the famous statesman and uh, diplomat. This was uh, Henry Kissinger who had just, uh, he's kind of coming out of the revolving door from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. So Henry Kissinger was an agent of the Rockefellers. And this would be, you know, the, the richest family or one of the richest families in history at the time. Uh, this is the, you know, 1960s. And uh, the Rockefeller uh, Rockefeller Brothers had funded several organizations very close to the World Economic Forum. There's another organization, sort of a sister organization called the Club of Rome. These are all very wealthy industrialists. So Klaus Schwab is just a young uh, academic, and he goes and sets up this European management symposium right after meeting Henry Kissinger. Um, so we don't have the meeting, you know, the meeting minutes of these secret uh, smoke filled rooms, but we know that there was always big money behind it from the get go before Klaus Schwab himself had any money. And uh, the Deutsche Bank, for example, was one of the first sponsors. This is one of the largest banks in the world. And so, um, yes, there's, he, he's in a way a front man or a spokesman for corporate interests who would prefer to sort of hang back in the shadows and not publicly state their goals. But that, I mean, then you look at the World Economic Forum sp sponsors every year since, and they are, again, all of the world's largest co and richest corporations who don't necessarily want to say that they want to rule the world and put the peasants into gulags if they disagree. But the World Economic Forum puts this friendly spin on it, saying we're improving the state of the world by, uh, you know, coming up with more and more tyrannical schemes. They, they cook up these schemes years before the, they actually get implemented. So they've only had the public's attention for the past, I'd say, five, ten years maybe. But before that, they're a few years ahead of when the, world, uh, when the United Nations will come out with something like a sustainable development goals or an Agenda 21 in the 90s, which has become Agenda 2030 uh, today. So by 2030, um, and the World Economic Forum came up with all of this before the UN implements it, before the world government signed compacts, things like the Paris Climate Accords or this new uh, World Health Organization pandemic treaty. That's been in the, they're all in the works for five, 10 years at the World Economic Forum first. And so Klaus Schwab, uh, you know, he's, he kind of just convenes it. He's very smart. He sits at the center of it. He's gotten extremely wealthy. Uh, and, and he, he kind of profits every which way off of the forum. His nephew set up a company to do the management of the forum, the teleconferencing and all these kinds of things. So he dumps a lot of that money back into his family's pockets.